You're I muted. Think, you're you're you. muted. Oh, sorry about that. How are That's you? Okay. Oh, wonderful to meet Thank you. you. Thank you. For nice to meet in. you. How are you guys today? Doing I'm good. good. Oh, you're good. The of flowers. You're doing great. Oh well, yeah, yes, yes. Um, it's uh, Stanford. Thankfully, grew these a while ago. They they didn't grow so well with the wildfires this year. That's too bad. Uh. Didn't grow so well. But yeah. yeah, thanks for doing Zoom. It's wonderful. Oh, yeah. thank you for doing this. Yeah. This, this is amazing. Well, we really you guys appreciate been? it. We're, I'm okay. We're yeah, all right. Hey, yeah. We yeah. were talking about distance learning for kiddos. and Oh, uh, yeah. Not easy. <laughs> yeah, not yeah. easy, though. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah. it's, it's, I teach high school kids, so my, I'm teaching remotely right now. Wow. Kids that are in school and online. So um, yes. I was explaining to Christina how that's really difficult. <laughs> but yes, she was also, and then she was talking about her issues with her daughter doing remote learning so we were bonding about that yeah <laughs> well you know on one side it's like good for food allergy parents not to have to be so worried about their kids you know having accidental ingestion so that kind of puts our minds at rest um yeah. and it, but on the other side there's all these other issues right I totally agree yeah. so not easy yeah new norm is going to change I think yeah well, and I was telling Christina that I'm so new to all this. So if I just sort of sit back and listen a lot, it's because I have no idea what you're talking about, but I'll make sure I <laughs> ask you guys. Um, I was just telling Christina that this is all new. I've never had any issues with food allergies besides like an intolerance, like my yeah. milk. And wow. my but well, my daughter had full-blown anaphylaxis to milk-based oh. foods in that seven months. Wow, and I'm sorry. My yeah, goodness. it was very scary. So I don't know anything. So Christina is way more knowledgeable about this. Wow. Well, yeah, I just yeah. figured more minds are better than one mind, in yes. my opinion. Just kind of get together and try to figure it out, you know, lean on each other exactly. a bit. Um, no, it's, uh, yes, leaning on each other is so wonderful. And then um, also just getting, you know, knowledge and then sharing it. And then I think everyone mm -hmm. in society is affected by food allergy in one way or another, right? You're a teacher, Ashley grandparents, coaches, state officials, like it's, uh, it's not going away. And it's an epidemic mm -hmm. of another proportion. And unfortunately, you know, we talk about that in the book, we're at the beginning of a cure, but we don't have a cure for everyone yet, especially for multiple food allergies. So we need to yeah. keep working on that. Right. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah. Well, did so, you want to go ahead and get started? Or do you want to give it a couple sure. more minutes or? Happy to. And then should I do anything to, do I need to link into the Facebook page or no? I, um, I don't think so. I have actually posted the link that was sent by your team on yes. our um, page. Perfect. There was some difference with time and all of that. So yeah. uh, unfortunately there may not be as many as that would love to come yeah. to hear you, but I was hoping we could maybe pass along the information at a later time so that yeah. they can hear um, no, that's great. It's not, yeah. not a worry. Um, I can answer the questions that Tatiana put online. And then um, also, you know, if there are any questions after that, you're welcome to email me. So just let the group know. I think this is getting recorded. So Tina okay. Nguyen, my admin, will link it to Facebook. I hope, hopefully, we'll see. Okay, great. great. Yeah. Um, so thanks. Yeah. So if, if we want to get started, I can just go ahead and, and read the questions that people yeah. have sent me ahead of time. Um, sure. The first question was, does anyone know why there seems to be a rise in pediatric allergies? Yeah, um, we talk about that in the book. We actually do have a lot of strong um, evidence now to say why there's an increase. Um, so I'll talk about that now. And then feel free, if anyone along the way has questions to ask me, I'm happy to do that. Okay. Um, I, I love questions. So, and I, you know, I mean, those- We love ones, answers. Yes. <laughs> good. And, you know, I yeah. think in all, in everything we do, we have to be humble and that we might not have the answers to everything, right? We're only as good as our data and what science has been shown to have a fact, a fact, and, uh, and then a fact, maybe just a myth. So in the book, we talk about myths and myth busters and what's real, what's not real to help parents and families or, or someone with food allergy. So allergies are increasing. One in three people around the world will have an allergy, period, at some point in their life. 
whether or not that's a drug, food, uh, insect, dog, cat. Uh, there's tons of people with chemical sensitivities, uh, especially as they get older. And then there's the garden variety pollens, right? And molds uh, and grasses and trees. So one in three individuals in the globe will have an allergy, period. Some, when that allergy happens, that increases mucus. And so that a lot of times people with allergies can have asthma. And allergies can stem from top to bottom. So they're anything from a rash to itchy eyes, to itchy nose, to asthma, to, um, to gut allergies. Like when you, some people with food allergies have gut allergies too. What we know allergies are not are, they're not fever. And they're not to like dead things. So people say hay fever, but it's actually, you're never allergic to hay ever because it's dead. So you have to be allergic to like something live, right? Um, except when it's a food or an insect, then, you know, those things are proteins. You're also allergic to proteins. You're not, when someone says they're allergic to water, I know that that may be something else. Um, or when they say they're allergic to sugar, it's probably something else, or there might be, something in that food that's also protein that they're allergic to. So proteins are what cause allergies for the most part. So now let's take a step back and say, well, why are we seeing an increase in food allergies? In Australia, it's up to 10% of individuals. In the United States for children, it's 8% of children under the age of 21 have a doctor's diagnosis of food allergy. And this is just not my son who says he's allergic to broccoli. Like this is real food allergy, right? Mm -hmm. and, um, and then when we did a big questionnaire throughout the whole country, we learned that 10% of adults have food allergy in the US now. So less and less children are growing out of it. More and more adults are having it. And then about half of the adults that do have food allergies learned that they had the food allergy when they were adults. They never had the food allergy when they were kids. Wow. And they were able to eat the foods prior. So now we think, okay, what's causing this? This is crazy. Why do we have to worry about this now? And we think it's due to many different things that are occurring in our environment. Because number one, the numbers are about doubling every 10 years. So that's more than just a generation. So that means there's something in the environment that's affecting this, that's affecting an adult going from a child without food allergies to an adult with food allergies. There's something that's going on in the child's life that's causing the food allergies. There is probably some genetics, but a lot of it is environment. And we know that because we have identical twins where they're in the mom, obviously, same mom, same breastfeeding most likely, right? Same environment at home, but one will get food allergies and the other one will not. And that's similar between identical twins and fraternal twins. So there's gotta be something in the environment. So outside of genetics, I wanna make sure all of you know, it's not your fault. Like as parents, we put ourselves through a lot of guilt trips, right? If your kids have food allergies. I just but, need to say that one more time and a little louder for me so I can okay. hear. Thank you all God right. for saying that. It's like, you can't help but wonder if it's something you did, right? Yeah. Absolutely, do not blame it. yourself on this one, do not. <laughs> And don't blame yourself if you think, oh gosh, I should have done that. Like what I'm going to tell you right now is, is knowledge to help others, is knowledge to help people in the future. But even if people did all of these things, they still might get a food allergy, right? This is not a perfect uh, formula for completely preventing food allergy, but at least it helps, right? So that we can decrease the chance and decrease the risk. So the first thing is, is, um, diversity of diet. There's a lot of papers now that have been published and a lot of things in the lay literature now like it, that you can get on Google that say diversity of diet early and often is really important. So it used to be that people were telling us all, and this is again when I was raising my children, like delay the introduction of peanut, delay the introduction of shrimp, delay the introduction of eggs, turns out to be not that helpful. We should have probably been getting those little bits of the foods in regularly early on uh, at around the time that they're trying to switch to solids, which is around four to six months of age. And so that's helpful to know that, that those guidelines have now been switched. Now most of the guidelines are saying, go ahead and diversify the foods early and often. 
um, while you're thinking about transitioning to solids. And you don't need to stage the foods. You don't need to do one food type and another food type. There's no reason for that. It's diversifying the foods are better for the gut to learn, oh, this is not a bad thing. This is something that I should use as nourishment. So that's the first thing, diversity of diet. The second D, I call it the Ds, is, um, is dry skin. So we've learned that children that have a lot of dry skin and eczema actually have an increased risk of allergies, particularly food allergies. So protecting that dry skin, making sure you use less detergents that are harmful and detergents in general that are harmful for the planet are harmful for the skin. So if you choose detergents that are better off for the planet, then they're gonna be better for your baby's skin to avoid as many detergents as possible. But that's not the only cause of eczema. Eczema is sometimes in children, I'll have one sibling in my clinics, for example, with no eczema, and then another sibling that has eczema. And the mother's like, oh my gosh, what, what is this? So there are some genetic components to that, but as much as you can, if, if your child does have eczema or you have eczema, just use really good skin care and skin emollients. And we talk about that in the book. Then the other D is vitamin D. So the reason why we believe Australia has such a high rate of food allergies and allergies in general is because they have a low level of vitamin D in a lot of their infant's blood because they use a lot of those skin. I think obviously um, taking care of your skin to prevent skin cancer and sunburn is really important. But what they realized is in Australia, because they were trying to prevent skin cancer, they were loading up the kids with all these um, uh, sunscreens, but they were not getting enough vitamin D. So supplement with vitamin D is really important, getting a normal level. So that's the third D. The other D we need to be careful of is kind of dirt. And I, I label that because there's the microbiome. And we need to think about, you know, what good things in the gut do we need to take to help our gut learn that um, it can uh, have um, a good inner lining and the balance of good microbiome, good gut bacteria with a nice seal around the gut so that it's not so leaky is very important. So I talk about that in the book that there's a lot of commercial products out there now, you know, in terms of what they would like us to buy for lactobacillus or acinobacter, all these different products that have different microbiome. And I talk about in the book, like what's probably better for the baby's gut and what actually is based on data. Because I understand there's a lot of published opinion out there, but what's published data so that you can sink your uh, teeth into literally and figuratively to say, oh, you know, that's better for my baby or that might not be very good for me or my children. So I hope that helps. Um, the other D is, um, the aspect that's moving forward to try to understand more about DNA, how much does genetics play a role? And I do talk about this in the book, but most people are born with allergies and they don't have to have had a family history of allergies. A lot of my patients in clinic get food allergies and none of their, none of their family had it before. So we're trying to understand this, but I hope that helps you. Yes, we do know why allergies are on the rise. We think it's due to some of these things and to be able to use them as knowledge now to try to prevent is hopefully helpful. Okay, that's wonderful. Um, does anybody have any, I have any other questions regarding that or I can continue down uh, with some of the ones that were sent in before? Anybody? The second question is why can, and I think you alluded to this and what you just say, discussed. Yeah, that's my question, and I think she said that, but I guess the third question is kind of, it's my, it was my question too, Christina, sorry to interrupt. You. That's okay, no worries. I was just going to say that um, the, the kind of going to what you were saying about diversifying the diet, um, how do we diversify the diet or how do the kids grow out of the allergies if like they're not exposed? So that was like the third question that I had, because if we can't expose them. In For example, you were mentioning. Ah, uh, yes, yes. Yeah. Great question. If, we, um, if she had anaphylaxis to four ounces of milk-based formula, now I'm afraid to give her anything with milk in it. 
right. diversify her diet. Absolutely, absolutely. So, so what I was talking about is everything about preventing the disease, right? But what happens once you have the disease? Um, one of the things we talk about in the book is the other way to get dirt in is like having a dog at home, right? And that, that's amazingly also preventative for allergies and food allergies, just having a dog at home in the first year of life. But of course we say, if you have a dog allergy, you can't get a dog at home. Yeah. So if you already have a food allergy, if your doctor, if you've got, first of all, let's say your child spits up with uh, a food and you're learning that, right? As, as a new mom or you're feeding and you're puzzled about something, take them in to see the doctor. That doctor will might say, okay, now go see an allergist. And when you go to the allergist, they will have you run through tests and you have to have a board certified allergist to do this. And they'll do skin tests and they'll might do a food challenge. And we talk about sort of the way to diagnose food sensitivities versus food allergy in the book as well. And what you should ask your doctor once your child has been diagnosed with a doctor's diagnosis of food allergy, then absolutely, then the tables are different. Then we're not talking about prevention, then we're talking about therapy. And therapy is interestingly enough, also in, involves giving small amounts of that food very carefully over time. And that builds up your immune system and your immune strength to be able to counter the allergy, but that takes a lot of time with skilled people and it's gotta be done really carefully with um, someone that knows how to do that. So that's on the therapy side. Does that help you, Ashley? Yeah, that sounds very familiar. My, my son was diagnosed with peanut allergy last year. And so the, the discussion I have with the allergist who's wonderful um, is that we will be doing some blood work every year to see what right. levels he's at and to see That's when right. he might be ready for that challenge. He's not ready at this point, but maybe at some time in the future, he would be. So. That's right. Exactly. So they're being careful. They're watching that. He must have had a high enough amount on the blood test and the skin test to say, okay, let's wait. And a and reaction. Then, yeah. Okay. And then in therapy, your allergies can change like every six months. So you want to get assessed every six months. If you're not doing therapy, it's about every year you get okay. watched. And that's, okay. so that's right, Olivia. That's, a, that's what we would suggest to you. Okay. Um, another question was any new treatments for allergies that, are, that have come out recently? Um, yeah. So um, we spend like a couple chapters in the book about this, that there are a lot of new treatments. So that's fantastic. Um, there are, there's one that's just been approved by the FDA. So that's great. That's why we actually wrote the book. And, um, in addition to that, there's new, um, products. So there's the oral immunotherapy for peanut, but now we need to worry about all the other nuts because most people have allergies to not just peanut. It's mm -hmm. other nuts, it's milk, it's egg, it's wheat, it's sesame, many other things, the shrimp fish. So with that, we now have a multiple food allergy therapy. That's great. That's moving forward with the FDA very soon. There's another comp there are some companies that are making products to use with the oral immunotherapy to try to make it safer. So that's good. Those have gotten breakthrough designation by the FDA. The FDA has really been wonderful in thinking about food allergies and what to do. Um, in addition, there are vaccines now that that's great. These are real, these are different from COVID vaccines or different from infectious disease vaccines. These are vaccines to actually help protect your immune system against the food allergen. And then finally, there's actually molecules that are made very personalized to your allergy that you could take every month and that completely protect you from allergic reaction. So you can wow. eat what you'd like. So it's kind of like sight unseen. You just take this every month as a shot and then you don't have to worry about your food allergies potentially. So these are some things to get excited about because I think you can rely on some science now to deliver um, on the hope and promise of therapy and prevention, but it's all based on science. But we have a ways to go. Like these are some exciting things to get excited about, but um, they need a lot more data to them to make sure that they're safe and effective. 
Um, the next question is, my daughter is 10 months old and has just been diagnosed with milk, egg, peanut, tree nut, and soy allergic and Anna to milk. How can you speak on shared lines, meaning production lines, and what to know for those with multiple allergies? Yeah, it is much more common now to have multiple food allergies. And unfortunately, it's less and less common that you're going to grow out of them. So baby should be followed like your, your little 10 month old. I, I think that this is very common now to see these degree of allergies and to see that spread milk yeah. and nuts. These are different. They don't look the same. They come from a cow versus a tree, but you do need to worry about labeling. And I think the FDA put together some labeling laws back uh, during the Obama administration in 2009 to clarify, you know, what is in that food. But a lot of the labeling laws still depend on the company to put down what they think might be a contaminant or made in the same facility as, right? So the language is not clear. So we go through in the book what language you need to worry about in terms of what things could be an ingredient that could not just be a contaminant level, but could actually be a higher level because okay. that's what you worry about, you worry about axonal ingestion. So I would say if your child is found to be allergic to those things and your doctor has said she's allergic to X, Y, and Z, then you need to avoid those foods that say they contain or may contain X, Y, and Z. Okay. I is hope that helps you. I know that's, it's easier for me to say than to actually do in practice, <laughs> it's very hard. So I would say, especially for people with multiple food allergies, please try to go to a clinical research center nearby you because there are clinical trials going on right now for multiple food allergies. And they do not have a placebo group, i.e. they don't have um, an arm where you just have we to don't. worry about getting nothing. They don't have that anymore. Right. So in clinical trials, most every clinical trial we're running in the US right now always has both arms with therapy. Okay. And that's important. So I would say, please look at the clinicaltrials.gov website. I give that as a resource in the book. And there are ways to enter into clinical trials. And if, if you're not sure if there's a site nearby you that you can participate in, just email me and I'm happy to look. Okay. Just one more follow-up question with just that point that you made about um, like, uh, well, I'll just say, um, if, if, like, I really thought I gave her peanut, I gave her peanut butter and I gave her almond milk and yet she still came up as positive to allergic to those in the skin test and in the blood, blood test. Is there like a false positive? Like some of the women have talked about that on, on um, the forums. Yeah, great question. So that's, that, that says to what degree we're not perfect in our diagnostics yet. And that, that's getting better because when you think we're still using skin prick tests that are as old as like a hundred years ago, like you go in there and you're like, really, you haven't gotten anything better than this? You're causing my child to be in pain and itch. And then this, the blood tests are getting a little bit better, especially with the components, but the gold standard is the food challenge. And then you also should ask, wait a minute, do you really have to do this? You have to use the same exact thing. And I have to watch my child in a staged approach and be worried about whether or not they're gonna have a reaction that day. Right. Because of the fact that skin tests can be falsely positive a lot of the time, the blood tests can be falsely negative sometimes and false negatives are not great. So what we typically say is, okay, if you're able to eat the food and not have a reaction, that's the best way to diagnose. So even though the skin test might be positive or the blood test might be negative or the blood test might be a little positive, if you're able to eat the food, that's the best test ever. So don't worry about the skin prick test, the blood test so much. The fact that your child's eating the food and able to eat the food without a problem, that's what you should count on. Okay. okay. Um, let's see, what sorts of words and things to look out for when giving my son his food? He has milk protein allergy. His pediatrician says yogurt and cheese are okay since the protein is broken down. Ah. Yeah, um, I, I think that it depends on the type of milk allergy. Mm -hmm. There, when you do skin tests, you could actually do skin tests. You could put the little uh, skin prick in cheese and then yogurt, uh, uh, not different, 
different prongs, obviously. So I test for cheese, then I test for yogurt, then I'll test for milk, um, you know, just basically like a glass of milk. And then I'll find out if the child can, if it's negative, if the skip test is negative, you know you can most likely eat that food because there are breakdown products. There's different versions of these proteins of milk in each of these foods. And you might not be allergic to cheese milk, for example, because it is broken down. So it's good to, to try that because it's a nice source of protein if your child can have cheese or, or a yogurt. I think Tatiana, you'd asked a little bit about, are these trials only in the US? There are some trials going on outside the US, but they're less, okay. um, yeah. Skin tests, it's hard to get an appointment for skin tests. If you're in a clinical trial, they'll happen much more frequently. Um, so uh, unfortunately we need more allergists around in this country. We only have a few training programs. So for example, in the Bay Area, sometimes it takes nine months to see an allergist. So mm -hmm. we need to get better at providing um, office visits for people. Sure, I've had that experience here in Charlotte even. We had to wait three months to be seen. Um, and, you know, yeah. you're, you're kind of worried during that time. Yes, and, that's um, right. So, but there's, I agree with that. Um, the next question, is there a link between the severity? Because I know you, um, your assistant had mentioned you're doing some work with COVID. And it's, yes. link, it's link between children with allergies and asthma. So the question is, is there a link between the severity of COVID-19 reaction and children with allergies and asthma? Yeah, um, great question. So we actually are looking very deeply into that. So we're looking at all the numbers of our food allergy patients, our asthma patients, and our COVID patients. So for now, we do not see any worsening of food allergies with COVID, and we don't see any worsening of COVID with food allergies, so both ways. Mm -hmm. But with asthma, if you have severe asthma and you get COVID, it will probably be harder to get rid of the COVID. Mm. If you have COVID, we have not seen that people can develop allergies or severe asthma from that COVID. So that's mm. good. Yeah. So I hope that we're studying both sides of the picture here, but food allergies don't seem to play a critical role both ways. Does that Something. It does. And as a follow up, um, so some of our children have been diagnosed with reactive airway as opposed to asthma. And I'm my understanding, correct me if I'm wrong, is that you have reactive airway at a younger age until they can properly diagnose you with asthma at a later age. So does that also apply to reactive airway disease as well? Yes. So, Okay. So Olivia and all of you on the phone, you're probably going to be able to take your medical boards uh, when you're all done. Like you guys have learned, you've learned, you know, you've already learned so much and you could have probably done that before talking to me today. Like, I just think you have wonderful questions and this is what it's going to take. We all want to educate ourselves, especially as parents and especially as people with allergies ourselves. So reactive airways disease is currently coined as the term to use like wheezing and reactive airways before the age of about five. After five, you can actually do this special test called spirometry and you blow into this little tube and then you look at this little wave. And so that'll tell you definitively if you have asthma. So no one should have in their chart before the age of five the diagnosis of asthma because it relies on that machine and that machine cannot be um, well used if you're under five years of age. Okay. You're right. Okay. Thank you. Um, why is it that so many instances of hives are never given a cause? Ah. Are hives usually related more to food or environmental allergies? Gosh, you know, hives are on the skin. They tell us a lot of things. In medicine, we call something a differential diagnosis. So if you have hives, it could be caused by many, many things. So one major thing that hives can be caused by are infections. I, maybe a lot of you, when you were kids or when you, when you were raising your kids or you're raising your kids right now, when they get a virus, they can get some weird patterns of rashes mm -hmm. and uh, hives on their skin. So that could just be caused by a virus or a bacteria. Then there's another group of hives. It's actually caused by autoimmune disease, like 
thyroid disease. If you have thyroid problems, you can get hives. You, um, and then there's another portion of hives that's caused by anxiety. Anxiety alone can give you hives. Okay. Um, and then there's another portion of hives that's caused by chemicals. Like if you rub chemicals on your skin, uh, hopefully none of you have had to deal with this, but they can cause some pretty bad hives. And then finally, there's allergies to proteins. There's if you're allergic to a dog or a cat or pollen, you rub up against that item and you get hives and they itch. Same thing with uh, foods. So 80% of reactions to allergies are skin deep. They can relate in the ways that hives and hives can go away with um, just some cold compresses and ice and some Zyrtec, for example, or cetirizine. So I, or creams. So I hope that helps you. Hives kind of are your, your signal of a lot of different things that could have caused them. Yeah. Does that help? Yes, it's interesting. I have a six-year-old who has just recently, this year, um, struggled pretty, pretty bad with hives and to the point where the Zyrtec and all that over the counter stuff doesn't work. We've had to go on steroid weans oh, and sorry. things like that. So yeah. just trying to get to the bottom of what could be the cause. Um, yeah, it could be a chronic exposure to something. If it is chronic hives, if it's more than six months of like every other day or daily hives, then go to the physician or allergist because it could be something else called chronic urticaria and that has to be diagnosed. Okay, got it. Um, I think just a few more questions. Uh, can a child be smaller and weigh less because of lack of dairy in the diet? Um, yes. So you have to really talk to a nutritionist uh, because if you don't, dairy is such a, a large source of protein and fats. Um, and it's a great nutrition source for a lot of people that if you're not, if you can't eat it, then you have to supplement with something else in the diet. So talk to a nutritionist. That's really important. We do talk a lot about nutrition in the book. Okay. Um, let's see. So there's one more question, I think. I forgot to, um, she mentions, uh, our allergist says that my son's allergy numbers are low enough that he doesn't qualify for OIT. Is that the norm? So it's just a wait and see for us, is her question? Yeah, so that's where if, if your allergist has said he doesn't qualify, but the, I think the best thing to do would be to actually go on clinicaltrials.gov and call the clinical trial centers and see if he or she qualifies. Then you'll know for sure. Okay. So definitely trust your doctor, but I know even, even uh, as a busy doctor, I don't have time to look at all the clinical trials so I would, I would tell the parent, okay, please look at it, see if what I'm saying is correct or not, and then get back to me. So there are many resources you can have access to and then find out for yourselves. Okay. Does anybody else have any questions, Ashley? Sorry, me, the talker. <laughs> uh, I'm the, the, the teacher. I'm in the group. Great. Um, so um, my doctor mentioned that EpiPens should be like the first line of defense, like don't even give my daycare provider Benadryl at all, um, which really goes against like what I always thought as a just a teacher, like, you know, like in an emergency situation, give the EpiPen, but like up until that time. Yeah, it's sort of just, uh, you know, this safe, yeah. but not necessarily the first line of defense. So should I be like, in other words, I don't know how anxious I need to be about the use of the EpiPen. Can, can, is this something she could become immune to? Like a lot of women have talked about that. Oh, oh, oh. yeah. You don't become immune to an EpiPen, period. So that's good, ever. Um, yes. So if someone, so the way we tell people to use injectable epinephrine devices, and there's a lot of different ones now. There's the common one that we call EpiPen, but there's also now others. There's generic one. There's, and I'm so glad that schools now do have a law about being able to provide injectable epinephrine devices to children that need them. And, and hopefully we can do that across the land. But um, an epinephrine device is the only known item to actually get you out of an anaphylactic reaction. Not steroids, not antihistamines. And antihistamines come in lots of different flavors. There's Zyrtec, there's Benadryl, there's Claritin, there's Allegra but none of those will actually really help you with a bad anaphylactic reaction. What's a bad anaphylactic reaction, right? When do you use the injectable epinephrine device? 
You use it for any wheezing, any difficulty breathing, and usually all of these allergic reactions are within two hours of eating the food. Not typically after that. So we're, we're talking about a finite amount of time. So, and if you can use the EpiPen within a minute of a bad reaction, that's the best. But if it doesn't work within a minute, you use another one. So that's why you should always carry two at all times. And you give it in the side of your leg. Um, you can get it through clothing, it's fine. So you use it for shortness of breath, difficulty breathing, or if you're turning blue and getting dizzy. Those are like the main features. Okay. If the child comes to you in your school and they have hives, for example, and they know that it's been two hours, you know, that, that it's been within two hours of eating the food, watch them because the hives could turn into sh shortness of breath and difficulty breathing. So you still wanna watch them. But the first thing for hives, for example, is to give some antihistamine. And I typically like to use Zyrtec because the Benadryl can make you sleepy. Yeah. So I, I tend to try to use those antihistamines that don't make you sleepy. So if they didn't, they didn't give her an EpiPen at the hospital because even though her lips were swollen, her eyes were swollen and she seemed to be, she was coughing. And, but then we got there and I'd given her Benadryl and she didn't get an EpiPen. So was it not anaphylaxis? Like, can your, can your whole face swell and have like, she's, I, I know this is particular to yeah. me. No, that's fine. You're absolutely right. So hives and skin swelling is all kind of in the same exact symptom. So oftentimes we would not give an injectable epinephrine device for that. I know it looks, you know, like, oh my gosh, what's happening? Mm -hmm. But as long as she's showing good oxygenation, they probably, when they, she got to the emergency room, they probably tested her oxygen levels. Yeah. And as long as it's good, you know, they'll watch carefully. But sometimes, um, it, again, as long as they're not coughing and having shortness of breath and really having difficulty breathing, then, um, then it's okay just to watch the facial swelling, try to give the antihistamine and not give the injectable epinephrine. But you'd want to you did the what's right, which is to go to an emergency room and mm -hmm. to get watched because these things can easily and very rapidly go from facial swelling to difficulty breathing. So you want to be in a facility that's watching you. And, it's, and then they make the decision about the injectable epinephrine. Okay. But the, there's not that much caffeine in there, right? It's about the equivalent of two espressos at a Starbucks. Like, I just want people to know if you have to use the epi at home, go ahead and use it. You don't, if, if you're at all even concerned, just use it. There's okay. no major safety issue for using it. It'll help no matter what. Okay. Thank you. Um, Dr. Nadeau, can you give us the name of your book if some of us are interested in learning more about what your, what your research yeah. shows? There it is right here. It's called The End of Food Allergy. Okay, awesome. You. It was so funny because when you guys reached out to us to do this this question and answer session, I happened to see you on a news segment. Oh, great. <laughs> I thought, well, it was meant to be that you were coming to talk to us. I mean, it was uh, the same day or the well, next day or something. So, oh gosh, well, yeah. I, thank you. I'm I'm excited about all the things that we can try to do together, and I I think that the world is made of, you know, small groups of people and uh, that we can try to make an impact and advocate and have voices for each other. So I really thank you for today. And I really attention. appreciate it. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, um, be before we end, does anybody have any further questions or? I, I do probably... you don't mind. <laughs> Sorry. <Sure. laughs> okay. I have two. One of them is about the book. <laughs> Um, uh, my first question is, um, my 17 month old was, was diagnosed with a garlic allergy and, yeah. um, and that was done through blood testing and skin testing, as well as an anaphylactic reaction. That's um, right. and then at his, at his last, um, blood testing, it came back negative, which to begin with, it was very low. It was like 0.6. Yeah. And, and this last one, it came back negative. But our allergist is hesitant to challenge um, because she said that um, garlic allergies are becoming more prevalent and they just don't know how they work. This, like, like in comparison to like milk and egg, they know how those work, but no. she isn't sure how the garlic works. And so I don't know. She was hesitant about it. Huh. Um, yeah. Is there anything so, you can share? <laughs> well, sure. It's. 
there's a protein in garlic that you're allergic to. Garlic, it's it's all protein. So I think most importantly is if if you it's hard, I think she'd have to stage a food challenge. It is possible to do. We have done garlic. Uh, food challenges with garlic powder you can buy at the store mm -hmm. and you start with a small amount and you stage up so if the blood right, like he, negative, he tolerates garlic powder completely fine oh well then that's great so you yeah, could, his reaction was to like dehydrated garlic and fresh garlic. ah okay so um you know is, if the blood test is negative and the skin test is negative and you might just want to go into your allergist and get a skin test then i'd say that's a, those are all great signs and if you okay. feel more comfortable you know, doing that, that dried garlic in the allergist's office, you could just let the allergist know, but I, and, um, I think that it should be fine. Okay. And then my second question is about your book. Um, yeah. so is, and I might've missed this. I got in on the zoom a little late, but, um, is your book more, um, information that for how we can prevent and treat allergies at home? Is it, um, th more things that we talk to our doctor about? Yeah, it's all the above. It's basically your how to go to handbook for anyone that has a food allergy or anyone that doesn't have a food allergy. It's about, you know, what are food allergies? How do we diagnose them? How are they different from food sensitivities? What do you ask your doctor if you do have a food allergy? And then also, what can you do at home to decrease the risk of food allergies and to try to help um, maintain good health around decreasing the risk of food allergies? So it's everything. And then it also, talks about um, a lot of resources for people with food allergies and what to do with those resources. So, and, and everything that I talk about is based on science um, and based on information that we know to be strong facts. And then the other thing the book does is tell you, there are a lot of things that are out there on Google and things that aren't necessarily true. So we go through that in the book about making sure you don't, no one gets duped into buying a product that you don't need or you shouldn't necessarily use because it could be unsafe. Perfect, thank you. Okay, good. All right, well, I hope that was helpful, guys. It's really nice thank to talk you. to you. I hope all of you are safe and healthy where you live. I know it's been a tough year um, and we're dealing a, a lot with a lot of different epidemics, but thank you for your attention today. We really appreciate your thank time. You. I hope we can maybe speak at a later date, maybe in a few <laughs> months or so. That'd be okay. great. All right. Have a good day. Great. Thank you. Bye, guys. Okay. Bye-bye. Thank, Thank you. Bye. Christina. Thank you. Thanks. Nice to meet you.